so many cop. Yes, we're back. We're back with the green screen, as you can see, back in pie. Oh, tear trickling down. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. So anyway, if you haven't seen the other videos I posted, it's uh, mission accomplished. We got the condo, and um, the renovations will start uh, after the weekend, from Monday next week, and uh, we'll have a sink, and it will have a tie. Ooh no wee, no good. Ooh wee, ooh wee. It will have a sink, and it will have a uh, stove, which it doesn't have now, and it'll have a 40-inch TV. Um, the funny thing is, I didn't. It's not a smart TV for that price. You know, I paid four thousand one hundred and thirty dollars for a forty-inch TV, uh, and for that price, it doesn't. It's not a smart TV. Um, it just it will just take an input. Now you can buy a Android box for like two hundred baht, so uh, six six uh, three hundred baht to ten dollars. Sorry, twenty dollars. Twenty dollars you can buy a Android box from Lazada. Uh, and have a smart TV. So anybody who really wants that can buy the box and they'll own the box and they'll hook it up to my TV and it'll work. But day one, I'm looking at a Thai person or there's a lot of people who live from uh, Myanmar, from Burma, who live in that building. So, you know, a Myanmar person who's working in Thailand or a Thai person or a Thai family, um, they're going to go with what she likes, which is the OTA, over the air, free TV. Thais like it because it's free. <laughs> Uh, and that's a one-time setup where you pay, I paid 2,000 baht, I don't know what that's frying price probably, I don't know what ties pay, but you get a satellite dish in a box and then you get free TV every you know month, day, year after that. That's already there. The gentleman who owned the cop who had the apartment before uh, has a set-top box. So all I'm doing is putting a big-ass flat panel TV up and hooking it to the free over the air, getting local channels. That's what they'll have day one. If they want more, they can buy more. That's on them. So anyway, mission accomplished. You can go watch the other videos on, on me buying the condo, closing on it, being at the land office if you want. So today, we're talking on the uh, February the 7th, which is um, Super Bowl day. Well, it, tomorrow for you guys. It's Yeah, it's, it's Saturday night. So tomorrow, Sunday, it's Sunday here now. Um, it's Super Bowl day. Uh, I might try to figure out how to watch that on my Android, see if I can get that live. Um, if I can, actually that would be, if it's like 6 o'clock at night, that would be 6 in the morning, Monday morning. Yeah, so when I wake up Monday morning, I'm going to try to see if I can find the Super Bowl uh, on the internet, basically, and watch it. Uh, so anyway, on the, <laughs> the 7th, three minutes in, let's get to the, uh, the reading, shall we? The privilege of bringing children into the world carries with it the responsibility of teaching them the fundamentals of sound character. Antifa? What? One of life's greatest joys is the sense of wonder that accompanies the arrival of a tiny new human being into the world. But that joy is accompanied by a tremendous responsibility that perfectly encapsulate, encapsulates the need for personal initiative. You can provide children with all the physical advantages of a good childhood, but unless you strive to set a good example for them to follow, you will know only dismay as they reach adulthood and blossom into purposeless drifters. Wow, wow. There you go. It's almost like he saw it coming, right? Why am I crooked? Don't be crooked. Be straight, more or less. Now I'm crooked that way, but okay, whatever. Uh, your personal initiative, whether or not you are raising a child, must always incorporate exemplary behavior. You cannot take ethical shortcuts, big or small, without other people observing them and assuming that this behavior is something you wouldn't mind having turned back on yourself. Wow, there you go. Certainly you will make mistakes, but if you have always striven for the best course, others will remember it and treat you accordingly. So, children. You know, so I'm, I'm determined to keep this on track. And I talked for three minutes before I started reading. And now I'm about to go off again because that's how I do. That's how I roll. I don't have any children. I was married 10 years to a lovely woman, great, great lady, uh, Lauren, sweetheart. Uh, and before I married her, I asked her, do you, do you have to have children? Do you want children? Is it, is it a deal breaker? We were about 
four months in and things were getting, you know, serious. I married her for 10 years. Um, so at that point I wanted to make sure the issue of having children wasn't going to kill the relationship. And she said, eh, I'm, I'm meh about it, M-E-H for those of you who don't know, meh. In other words, she, if she met a guy who wanted to start a family, she would have kids. She was okay with that. But if she met a guy like me who didn't want to have kids, she was fine with that. But cool. And keep in mind, I was 35 at the time, and she was 34. She was one year younger than me. And, um, you know, having kids when you're in your 30s is you know, sometimes it leads to physical problems and stuff like that. So that might have played a factor in her decision. Um, but the fact that she was meh about it meant, okay, so she's cool with no kids, and we move forward over the relationship, and, you know, six months later after that or whatever, eight months later, we got, we got married down in Florida. So the reason I didn't want to have children is I was... I did a, an honest self-assessment, which I, I don't think enough people do. You really got to know yourself and know what makes you happy. And I, don't, I think a lot of people really don't spend the time to sit and think about that and, and, and get to know themselves and know what makes you happy, what do you really want out of life, out of a mate, out of everything. And I love to travel. And I had plans to travel. I, I still have plans to travel. COVID. <laughs> has not only destroyed multiple small businesses, um, but it's also destroyed travel plans for many people who like to travel and enjoy traveling. I enjoy meeting new people and, and seeing other cultures and trying different food and, and all that. It's, it's something I like uh, and I like to do. And you know, in this effort to control us, or I'm sorry, it's an effort to protect us, protect us, keep us safe from a disease with a 99.98% survival rate, we can't travel anymore. We can't go to church, we can't go to small restaurants and bars, but we can go to big ones. Um, you know, all that makes sense. Um, now the new thing out is is a, a single mask doesn't work. You've got to wear two or three. And I've seen pictures of people wearing like eight fucking masks, thinking, well, if, if three is good, eight is better. True story. I've seen it. I've seen people wearing eight masks stacked up on top of each other. That's where we're at. That's where we're at as a as a society, as a nation, as a world. Uh, anyway, I like to travel, and so if we had had a child, you know, our first year, if I immediately set to the job of impregnating Lauren, sweet little Lauren, five foot three, blonde hair, real cutie, she looked like um, I dream a genie. She looked like the lady, Barbara Eden, who played I Dream of Jeannie back in the 60s, 70s TV show. Um, great person. Anyway, uh, if I'd had a baby with her, our, our lives, hers and mine, would be focused, or should be focused, uh, the, the, the way I'm at, I am, and she was too, she was a responsible human being, uh, would be focused on the child and the welfare of the child and the, and the raising of the child, right? Because you need to commit to being a parent and, and doing everything for the child. The baby comes first once you have a baby, especially in the first year, if not first three years, five years, whatever. I mean, the kid is priority one, should be. It's not for a lot of people, which is a part of the problem we have today, but um, for me and for Lauren, it, it, that would have been eat, sleep, breathe, focus on the baby, right, to raise it and meet its needs. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to travel with her, and we did, and we had a blast. We had the best time in the world. Now, some people are like, oh, you don't know, uh, you know, having a child is the best thing. Well, maybe, maybe for you, but for us, Traveling was the best thing in the world. So, um, you know, it was a mutual decision and we both benefited greatly and we went a lot of great places. You know, she used to say, uh, thank you, you made my dreams come true. I took her to California and we were in the audience of The Price is Right. That was a show she grew up watching and, you know, she absolutely loved it. It was the time of her life. Took her to the Grand Canyon, um, we went to Mexico you know, big resort and huge pool, you know, boat drinks. I mean, we had, we had a blast. We had a really good time. Two cruises, back-to-back -back cruises, 
flew to Puerto Rico, took a cruise, came back, stayed a night in Puerto Rico, took another cruise. Can't do that with a baby. <laughs> so, um, you know, we enjoyed our time together. We enjoyed traveling, and that wouldn't have been possible. I, my, the way I work, the way I'm wired, a baby, I, I couldn't have done it with that because I would have been focused on the baby. I would have been, you know, let's raise the kid. That's that's number one. You don't travel. You don't go on cruises. You know. <laughs> You don't do shit like that with a baby. You just don't. You know, you, you take care of the baby. I would have taken care of the baby. I would have sacrificed, you know, my life for a baby, and I, I didn't want to do that. So, that's part one. Part two was, I think before, on this channel, I've talked about Halloween and how it's changed since I was a kid. Right? How my mom in the 1940s used to go to her neighbor's houses, go inside the house with the other kids from the neighborhood and have cookies and cocoa, right? <laughs> that's, that's not happening today. There's no freaking way. And by the time I was a kid in the 70s, uh, trick-or-treating, we couldn't have, my mom would, would uh, take our pillowcase because we, were, we, were we, we didn't want the little plastic bucket of candy. Oh no, we wanted all the candy, right? So that was a change in attitude and, and mentality. So we'd bring fucking pillowcases out. And say, Here, put candy in my pillowcase. Go home, dump the pillowcase, and go out again. And we'd, we'd make three fucking trips and just dump all this shit on the living room floor. And some people would give out candy corn from a bag, the little wax triangles, orange and yellow. <coughs> Some kind of sugar, I'm sure, pure, pure sugar. We loved it as kids, but she'd throw that away because it was open. <clears throat> and uh, apples, she, the people would give fruit, you know, healthy instead of candy, and she'd throw that away because there'd been a story, an article, whatever, the year before, sometime she'd read an article that said, uh, beware, uh, people are putting razor blades in apples. Nice, nice. We go from sitting and having cookies and cocoa in somebody's house to fucking razor blades and apple. Good job, humanity. Nice. Yeah. And then, fast forward, I'm in my 20s, 30s. I have my own condo in Bedminster, New Jersey. I had just moved in like maybe a month before, so nobody knew me. I was a strange single guy, right? People can saw come and go in a friggin' Trans Am. And they, or, or no, I had the Super. I actually had a Toyota Super Turbo back then, before the Trans Am. And uh, they didn't know me. They had no idea who the hell I was. I didn't talk to any of my neighbors like people didn't do. This was in the 80s, um, or early 90s, actually. Early 90s, I think, is when I had the condo. And then that's where I was programming computers. I was a consultant, contractor, IT guy. And um, nobody came to my door. I was a stranger. <laughs> they didn't know me. And there had been a story, once again, like the razor blade and the apple. When I was a kid, there was a story that came out that year, prior to Halloween, saying some sick fucks were taking uh, syringes full of rat poison and injecting it into sealed candy, like taking a fun size Snickers bar, you know, buying a bag at Walmart for two bucks or whatever, and then taking rat poison and ch ch ch. Yeah, let's kill little kids who are coming out for candy. Broke, broken machines is what I call them, right? That's how I used to justify dealing with people like that. They're broken machines. He, he, they're broken. They, what the hell is that person doing on earth, breathing our air and <laughs> driving on our roads and eating our food? I mean, they, they're not a member of society, clearly. If you, if you think it's a good idea to inject candy for children with rat poison, you, you just don't need to be alive, period. And somebody has got to end you, um, you know, for whatever reason, or, you know, whoever it is, it, whether it's a fucking gas chamber or lethal injection or you get shot or whatever, karma, somehow, someway you need to die if you think it's okay to put rat poison in candy for kids. So that was happening in the 90s, early 90s, the rat poison, and it you know, got out and it killed Halloween that year. And subsequent years, people did come to my house and get candy, but that year, not a single person came. I went out, bought the candy, had the bucket ready to go, not one knock on my door, had the light on, everything, you know, nope, nope. None of the kids from the neighborhood came out. The moms were deathly afraid that I was a broken machine, a sick fuck, and I was gonna poison the damn kids' candy. They couldn't trust, fear. Fear, especially now, with the lockdown and COVID, everybody's afraid. So there is that. So I didn't want to bring a child into that world. 
you know, the, the Halloween, it's sad. There, there are people who put razor blades into apples. I don't think it was an urban myth. I, there are people who were poisoning. It was a real thing, it was a story. And it just takes one person to make everybody afraid and not trust. But yet, I mean, it, if you're sick enough and you read that article, you're like, yeah, that's a great idea. Why didn't I ever think of that? But let's put rat, rat poison in, in, in candy. Like you, you got, you know, it's a real concern that there would be copycats out there. They're too dumb to even come up with that an evil, sinister thing, but they, they can copy it, right? <laughs> Hackers, the vast majority, over 70%, 80%, are what they call script kiddies. Script kiddies don't know how to program. They, they never bothered to learn. It's too much work. They're too lazy. But they download hacks and run them. Oh, I'm a hacker. No, no, you're not. You didn't write that code. You downloaded it. Script kitty. That's what you are, kitty, a little boy, right? Because you're stupid and you can't invent that. So that's the majority of the hackers are, are guys who go up on the internet in the dark web or whatever and, and take down programs that other people have written. Other people who understand, you know, the communications and the, and you know, they're assholes. They're broken machines, so they write code to fuck up people's machines. And the script kiddies, who are too stupid to write the code, they download it and run it because you know, oh, I'm a hacker. Oh, well, no. <laughs> yeah, sure you are. <laughs> no, you you download and you, you you're like Joe Biden. You plagiarize. <laughs> Stealing shit isn't inventing shit. All right, so whatever. So that's, I mean, that's why I never had kids. So. If you do have kids, I hope you love them. I hope you raise them right. I hope you pour into them like he said. I hope you take the responsibility seriously like, like I would have if I'd had a kid. But ultimately for me, the choice was not to have one or any. <laughs> so peace out, Bubba.